full-time duty, believing in something, knowing, believing in something, knowing that they will sacrifice everything, even if it means lying their li uh, laying their life down for a stranger they never met. I have no regrets about accepting my calling to law enforcement and will gladly go through what I've been through these past nine months all over again. If it meant that uh, <clears throat> another person would get to go home to their family, that's what we sign up for as police officers. It's fun to go fast, it's fun to go to the hot calls, but when you, when you really think about it, you sign up to preserve life and property with the more important one being life, even if it means laying our own life down. So being stuck in a wheelchair or with the cane, I never thought I was going to be able to run again. My therapist believed, believed that I would, but I couldn't see it because I was stiff, in pain. I just didn't believe it. I was released from uh, the rehab center around March, and shortly after that, I started physical therapy at another location. There, my therapist encouraged me and gave me a goal to run a 5K this Sunday. For some, a 5K, which is three miles, is no big deal. For me, it is. Back then, it wasn't. For me, it is. It's been a huge deal. So slowly, I began to go. I first started walking, then slowly jogging, and slowly jogging a bit faster. Like I said, this Sunday is my first 5K since the collision. About two weeks ago, we went to Shackleford, which is an elementary school in South San Modesto, to run with uh, the students there. So they want police officers to run with them, and I gladly accepted. One, because I know how important it is to have a mentor as a child. Two, I enjoy running, and I know the importance of being fit, because when I was in the hospital, one of the doctors told me the only reason I'm alive well, there's many reasons, but the main reason I was alive is because I'm fit. He said, if I was a little bit overweight, my last night would have been in that car. So now I try to encourage other people to get out there and start moving, even if it's walking. So like I said, I'm going to run. I created a team called uh, Thumbs Up for Juan. So far, we have 52 people signed up. Some are running the half marathon, some are doing the 5K, some are walking the 5K, and some are running with me. So with that being said, I would like to thank you guys for attending this series of positive people. I know with life going on, sometimes you guys may have to do a sacrifice just to be here for an hour. I hope I have inspired you to face your own challenges head on in life without fear or hesitation. Life is a precious thing. Don't let it pass you by, because before you know it, it can all be over. So with that, I conclude my speech. So I think now we're going to move on to questions and answers. Thank you so much. And at this time, Juan has graciously opened up um, to answer questions from the audience. So we'll have a microphone on either side and we'll go by a show of hands if you've got a question. Gentleman back there with the black shirt, gray shirt. Just, just wondering what happened to the guy who struck you. So he pled to seven years in prison for a felony, felony drunk driving and assault with a deadly weapon causing great bodily injury. So his sentencing was last month. Okay, and we have one right here. Hello. So I'm really nervous. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to approach you with your fiance and I was very nervous. And I'm actually very nervous now, but I, I think it's important right now for everyone to know that 
the type of, and my voice is shaking, I'm not a public speaker, the type of officer that you are. You said that you were serving the West Side for a year and a half. And my, time, my own timeline is a blur, but before that, on four different occasions, you helped me, and I have never forgotten it. And now I'm the one crying. Um, I'm a survivor of domestic violence, and you came to my home, and you took a report, and you talked to me. I was human, and it mattered so much. And you came back when my ex tried to break into my house, and he tore my house apart trying to break into it. You came back with other officers, and you were the one who took him. Thank you. You were the one who took him to jail. So thank you. And when he was in jail, I needed to fill out a form to get a phone call to let me know that he was going to be out of jail. And you delivered that form by hand to my house, and you didn't have to do that. And I got that phone call the next night and that he was out of jail, and me and my kids packed up, and we left the house within 10 minutes. And you came back like six months later to check on my family. And that matters so much, the way that you serve your community. It matters so much, and I wanted to thank you. And I wanted everyone to know, like, that's who you are. And thank you. Hey, thank you for speaking up, especially about your circumstances. It's not easy being up here, and it's not easy talking in front of others. So I appreciate you speaking up. Okay. You mentioned when you were back in school that you reached out to somebody because you wanted to improve yourself and you kind of got blown off. What inspired you to continue moving forward despite the fact that somebody that you thought that would help you didn't seem to care? Well, I said mom would always be encouraging us, encouraging us to go to college. It wasn't until my senior year of high school that TRIO allowed us or helped us out to enroll into pre-college prep courses. That's why I kept going. If it wasn't for TRIO, I don't know if I would have continued with college just because I didn't know how. I would probably be one of those students who are lost, confused. So that's why I kept going. TRIO and UPS literally held my hand from MJC to Stan State all the way into graduation. Even now, I've spoken to my former counselors, and they still check up on me, see how I'm doing. So for those of you guys who come to Modesto Junior College or Stan State, or even if it's another college, I encourage you guys to seek TRIO, if your school has it, or EOPS. They all have them. If it wasn't for them, like I said, I probably would have not gone to college. So. Do you think you could ever forgive the drunk driver? Or have you already? You know, that was one of the hardest things I was dealing with when I was in the rehab center. I guess that I had, had every right to be upset, every, every right to hate the guy because of my injuries. One thing I had to mention was, so my body, for the most part, is healed with the exception of my left, left arm. I still, I'm still going through some issue with my left arm that may keep me from returning back to work. That could cause anybody to hate the person, right? Hate somebody who takes something they love away from them or because of a poor decision. You know, when I was in the hospital, I had a priest uh, come talk to me. And after talking, I told him how I felt about the incident. I told him how I felt about the guy, but he, ta he told me that, uh, I can't remember exactly now, but I'm going to paraphrase, he told me that hating the guy was only, was only going to cost me more damage internally, because if he doesn't care, you don't care if you hate him or not, you're going to suffer the consequences. So as far as forgiveness, I have, 
That's the only way I'm going to be able to move forward. That's the only way I'm going to be able to put all this behind me. There's no point in carrying this with me throughout my life. He's put away. I'm alive. I'm living my life. So what's done is done. I mean, I saw him in court, and uh, I told him to think about his decisions because drunk driving is not worth it. So does that answer your question? As an EOPS student, what advice would you have for me as well as others? Are you in EOPS right now? Yes, sir. You take advantage of it. Ask them questions. Have fun with it, man. A lot of people don't get involved in EOPS or do the bare minimum. You have to meet with them if it's still the same requirements three times a semester, beginning, middle, and end. Dude, if you have questions, meet with them more. What I did, three wasn't enough sometimes. Especially when I wanted to switch majors, going from business to psychology was not an easy decision because I'm like, oh, dude, I'm gonna be stuck in college all my life. <laughs> but uh, so I continued to meet with them to make sure I was on the right path. When I was looking to transfer from MJC, I applied to five different colleges or universities via the TAG agreement, you guys still have the tag agreement, the transfer agreement guarantee. Dude, if you want a secure way to get into the university of your choice, fill it out. Because what they could do is take your current classes, make sure they match up to the university of, the, uh, let's say San Diego. And if it matches, you pretty much fill a contract with UC San Diego, for example, saying, hey, if I take these courses, they will guarantee you a seat. So, my encouragement to you is seek him out, take, take advantage, ask questions, don't do the bare minimum, because they're there for you. So, I think Jim in the back, blonde hair. <coughs> so, what's three things that you value a lot more that you didn't value as much before your accident? Three things. Three things that value a lot more now that you've been through your accident that you didn't see or appreciate as much when or before your accident? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Thing number one is family. I mean, I'm not trying to say I didn't value them, but in my mind, I was like, hey, they're always going to be there. I'm always going to be there. You know what I mean? So that's changed. Now I try to reach out to my family members. I try to get involved. I try to make conversation where before it was just, they go to my parents' house when there's family, five, 10 minutes, leave. Now I make more of an effort to stay in communication with them. Uh, second thing I value is time. Through my time off, before the collision, when it came to time off, I was constantly doing something, constantly on the go, constantly I would leave my house like eight in the morning, wouldn't come back till 5 p.m. because I was just running around doing stuff that didn't matter. Now I look back and I'm like, dude, I don't have to finish everything in one day. Slow down, enjoy your life, enjoy your house, enjoy the people around you, watch TV. I'm serious because trust me, there's no point in being stressed out because you're trying to get everything done at once. And then the third thing, third thing, let's see. Family time. Huh, dude, third thing I would say is my job. Again, I did it for four and a half years. Right now I'm still in the books, but I've been on medical leave since January. So it's not the same being on the sidelines as the one inside playing the game, you know? I hear the stories, I hear the radio calls, but I can't participate. So another thing I began to value is my job. I valued it when I was in it, but sometimes I felt like I didn't value it like I should have. And now that I can be in it and potentially can't return to it, depending on how my arm heals, dude, it sucks. No. Right here. How you doing, Officer Royal? Good. My name is Julian Tapia. I'm a student here at MJC. 
I heard you said your uh, liaison in high school didn't talk to you appropriately for your career choices. If you had one thing to say to her, what would you say to her now? <laughs> I don't know, there's, there's many things that I would like to say to her, but... <laughs> Dude, if one thing I could tell her was, and we could honestly sit down and talk, I would tell her, hey, don't judge people based on the course that they're taking. Give everybody a chance, because you just never know. I mean, just because she told me, hey, I have no time for you, I'm going to focus on those who are going to get into a university. That I could tell you that some of those kids who I went to high school with who are in CP and AP courses, yeah, they got into a, a, a university, but they didn't finish. And I could tell you that because the only high was a big school, but everybody, everybody talks. Everybody talks about each other, how they're doing, their progress. There's some people who dropped out, and now I see them on the street. They're homeless, addicted to drugs, doing crimes. And I got to finish. So, I said one thing that I could tell her was, don't judge people based on their classes. We all deserve a shot. We all deserve an opportunity. Then once you get it, it's up to you whether you run with it or not. We have one over here. Hi, Juan, you're awesome. Um, you say you might not be able to return to your job, and you're very determined. Um, what is it that you want to do if you're not able to go back? Um, well, there's one thing that sticks out, and it's uh, academic counseling. The reason I say that is because if it wasn't for people who did that job, I wouldn't be here. I was told in order to do that job, you need to get your master's degree. So I enrolled back into college for my master's, and I started in uh, September. So I'm taking advantage of the time off I have right now, so getting it done. So that's what I would do. Encourage other kids to do the same. Push them to continue with their education. You're going to get one life, so you got to make the best of it. I think we have one last question right here. I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but what does it mean to wire your mouth, and why did they have to do it to you? Okay, so what does it mean to have my mouth wired? So the reason they did it was because when I got hit, my jaw here fractured. It didn't fracture enough where they had to go in there and cut it open to repair it. It was just one of those things that had to repair itself. So what they did is they took screws, like the ones you see at Home Depot. <laughs> I'm serious. And they put three of them on the bottom and three of them on top. And then they got some kind of wire. And I don't know if you ever had uh, braces, but they put them on the bottom screw real tight, and then they put them on the top, and they just twisted it. So my mouth was shut. So dude, I was on a liquid diet for about a month and a half. So you think I'm skinny now, dude? It's just me back then. <laughs> <laughs> Not fun, so I had that for six weeks. And then towards my last week of rehab, they came off. So first thing I did was eat solids. Dude, when they told me to slow down, I didn't listen. <laughs> and I'm sure Maria could tell you, tell you that. So yeah, that's, that's why I needed to have my mouth wired shut. Hey, Juan, uh, earlier you said that you were taking a lot of time off at work to do school work, stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I know you've been doing a lot of talking, uh, but we're going to be doing some talking after this. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, uh, you're a great young man. Um, you truly are inspiration to a lot of young kids out there, uh, especially those that are going to Modesto Junior College now. Um, the only thing I can tell you is I pray that you come back to work for us. Um, but if not, man, reach for the stars. I know you have it in you. So I love seeing you up there, man. Thank you.
So Juan has today in the audience, this is our third year doing the Positive Speaker Series. My name is Brian Justin Marks. I'm the Associate Dean of Student Services. And we've had alumni before, but I know Juan has about uh, five former teachers, staff, members of the UOPS trio in the audience. So I think you said it, sir, very well, is, is this is why we do the Speaker Series. So this is um, kind of emotional for a lot of us because this we have some wonderful faculty and staff here, and this is literally why we do our job. So to be able to first time book actually a former student to speak is uh, pretty remarkable. And I had him when he was 18 years old, and he talks a lot more than he did that first summer out of high school. So that's, that's a beautiful thing. Um, and we will keep this beautiful thing going on, excuse me, throughout the rest of the year. And I, and I get a little choked up because as Megan said before, this is our community. And it's very easy to walk around and to see what doesn't work in our community or see the obstacles in front of us. Um, but this is our community. And so we have in the audience, our next speaker will be in uh, November, John Griffin. John, if you want to stand up real quick. And our speaker in, in February, Adrena, is also not only an adjunct professor and a, and a local artist, um, but the, for those who come that day in February, she will actually be giving out her book for free and signing it. And then our last speaker will be our shyest one of the year, but we'll be rounding out our series with our English professor, ninja poet, Sam Piersdorf. Here, Sam, you want to stand up for the audience? <laughs> you want to stand up for the audience, Sam? Or? <laughs> So again, um, what we try to, to show you is, is with this series and with each year is just, again, the amazing people that are in our community that you can re reach out to. And so I know Juan mentioned before, he's more than happy to um, receive emails, phone calls, talk with him afterwards, but we wanted to give him one more round of applause for speaking today. And then again, uh, if you'll check out our website at mjc.edu backslash campus life, you can see the speakers and times for the uh, rest of the year. Thank you very much for coming, and everybody please drive home safe. Thank you.